and that's the story we're telling. Go ahead. So if you take your vision and you set boundaries around that begin with the first prototype build, or sorry, the first production build, and the end, the closing boundary is a uh, repeatable or recurring two-year apprenticeship, that's the project that we're applying for money for. And that's the project we're describing in the questions to the grant. So the sequence is build one production house, gain rev sell it for revenue, which leads to multiple production houses, which become the six month register which become the six month apprenticeship. The six month apprenticeship is crews of twenty four show up, they build as many houses as they can in that six month period, and they get paid a wage or an hourly wage according to the parameters we've already set, okay? Success of the six month apprenticeship then leads to two year registered apprenticeship through the Department of Labor, which is the ultimate goal of the thing that, of the project. Like if I were to describe this project to the Department of Labor, like why are you applying for this grant? To create a two year registered apprenticeship that combines open source manufacturing and uh, college credit at MCC. Okay. Um, For the timing on it, the MCC stuff, but that's beef. That's not in the six months leading up to the two year. That's only at the two year thing. We, we can play around with that. So we can have some MCC involvement. Uh, actually, no, we can't. So the, there's a clear delineation in the eyes of the Department of Labor right. in which a registered apprenticeship has to be at least one year long. Okay, so like, look at the six month apprenticeship as a refinement of the thing that you just did last year. Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a it's a practice run. Can we get crews of twenty four to and enough demand for these houses to start building them repeatedly over a six month period in a viable enterprise? That's the question that the six month apprenticeship answers. The answer to that question is yes, then we turn that into a two-year apprenticeship because now we have recurring revenue. We have a functioning like 24 person crew cycle and we know we know how to deconflict that and build multiple houses. Now we can go to MCC and say, okay, here's our here's our two-year schedule of house builds. We've already got the demand laid out and we've got the recruiting pipeline for that. Now let's build in the MCC curriculum like we talked about. Okay. All right. So months, that's yeah. That's the story we're telling. Yeah. Let's let's talk about it. So, twenty four. <clears throat> Can we think of this as when do you have the scaling from twenty four to the next level? Is the twenty four proven in the first one? In which case we can scale that program to five five that or something or starting with you know two times that, but. Once we show that we can handle 24, yeah, we want. I would actually like to create a clear pathway for 10x. Can that happen within 20 of uh, the two-year period or two or three years? Where if we show we can do it for 24, then pending management business development, can we scale that to 10x? Because that's how we got to think about growing. Like either a franchise. We're setting up new operations elsewhere or in-house. Like I would do this in-house. What I would do is we, if we can do 24, I want to be able to do 200 like on this side, assuming that we'll snap up maybe a little bit of more land here. But can we mix the, the thing that's missing for me right now is how do we mix the other lifelong learning stuff where it's not just this apprenticeship like you're just proving the model for the the DOL apprenticeship it's it's much more than that it's a lifelong learning the promise that you're actually buying into the whole vision with intent of one is you up your skill set because you're constantly learning to do new things like designing and so one is you're the grunt right you you we make the money we we cross subsidizes by brute force builds with innovative methods that break various barriers. But right. after that, I want to. I want that to be a foundation for a much more visionary thing. Not just oh, we're just gonna get more, more Amazon workers till they unionize. 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. We're, we're, yeah. we're like constantly in a growth growth thing, which which in practice, what that would mean in the first apprenticeship, I would want to get people for the the more advanced track. Like I would want a, an apprenticeship where people are paying OSC for the learning. Like here's maybe like 50% learning, 50% work kind of a thing. Not just what we were talking about now where a pr- plain apprenticeship is like you're pretty much working and you, you're going to just... This is your job, like your hard job that you know you need vacation from, right? Uh, can we set up a parallel track? What I'd love to see is my, my vision on that would be, okay, we've got the grunts with me. I'm in there too. But also we've got this other level where we're doing something like 50% learning, 50% grunt work with the intent that we're rising up in management, design ability, leadership ability, all of that, peak performance, all the visionary stuff that you have a clear pathway to pretty much say, you, you set your, you literally, like the, the mind frame here is we're, we're teaching people to open up their index of possibilities towards I, I set my life, I set my pay, I'm gonna be an entrepreneur, that kind of a thing. So I think some of the people from the the basic just the builders are going to migrate into that definitely definitely but i want to be centered around that promise not that promise being ancillary so how does that fit to what we can do i think i don't know if this is right so i'm just going to tell you what i think we have to do i think what we have to do is just tell a very simplified version of that to the grant reviewers and retain er- all of the other aspirations around how you want to scale this program to yourself. Like the, <laughs> that's doable. Uh, we could like I, I don't think it's relevant that the, it'll just complicate things for the grant review process. So like, all I'm saying is we're, we're, we're just tailoring the message to this audience. This audience is concerned about allocating tax dollars for something concrete. Okay. So maybe what we can do is we take a look at the base requirements of their expectations, what they call success, and that, and the answer is and, and like always. Because and means that we can satisfy what they're looking for, I think, easily, synergist- synergistically with what we're trying to do with the much, much grander vision. So right. we should just write the grant for this, and that's going to just add to whatever else we're doing. And maybe like forget exactly. about all this that I told you right now. Maybe just keep it to myself. Keep no, no, no. I mean, no, no, no. Don't keep it to yourself. All I'm saying is that you have to be, you have to pick and choose what you put in front of them because you're dealing with a human being with limited time and attention. And so you, you want the grant writer to read this and just have a very easily understand a a project start to finish that can is eligible for taxpayer dollars. That's it. Now, when you start talking about 10x scale and lifelong learning, anybody's going to be sympathetic to that and think that it's a good thing. What the grant review team is specifically scrutinizing is whether or not there's any evidence or any any concrete um, like data to support that as a like realistic accomplishment from this money a realistic outcome of this money. Mm-hmm. And I think it's harder to paint that picture for them than it is to say, we've already done the legwork on the apprenticeship. We've got relationships with MCC. We know how to build this. Literally, the only thing we're missing is money. And we have the plan to develop the business to get from where we are today to starting that apprenticeship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> you know, I'm not, I'm not concerned about, like, the, this ARPA grant is a very small port, is, is, again, setting a boundary around a very small part of this power plant that you're building. Okay. That's all. Then we can do, like, pretty much the story that you told, because, yeah. Yeah. And what are, um, so maybe let's yeah. go through the grant and, and just go through some okay. specifics. Yeah. All right, so, um, you know, Brian hasn't answered this. So, so the first question up for Brian is question eight, section three. So he hasn't answered it. Uh, who's um, following up with Brian? Are you, you going to follow up with that? Are you going to manage this whole process? or? 
Yeah, I'm um, trying to think of the best way to do this. Actually, it's probably easier if I just cons have a consolidated to-do list. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm, I'm just going to open up an email and, and capture this. Yep. Yeah. Question eight. All right, question 10 is done. I have to rework it around the uh, parameters we just discussed. Mm -hmm. Question four, <clears throat> provide a short description of your proposed project. That's also a sign of Brian. He's done, I think, like a 70% version. So he needs to section four. So that's Brian. So he needs to, he needs to finish that. Mm -hmm. Um. I think that's fine. Question six. I don't know what's going on. With, like question six is is to briefly describe your project area. So that should also be Brian, because I don't know shit about. All right, narrative. All right, so question one, this is you. Yeah. Section five. Let's see what we got there. How much answer we got there? Nothing. Um. <clears throat> can you handle that? You think now? Because I'm going to sure. complicate things. No, based on this, I, I, yeah. I think the um, conclusion we just <laughs> attained earlier is that I'm not qualified. Okay, sure. <laughs> Question three, again, complete, needs to be edited. Question four, uh, needs to be turned into a prose Question story. Four. Sorry, what's quick provide a detail to accept impact? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. So, what are you gonna say? What we're like? Does that sound right, or do we tone those numbers down, tone them up? What? What do we do? No. I mean, I think you 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 stay aspirational. So, everything we're writing is based on the assumption that that we're gonna build a house. It's gonna generate demand, and we're gonna. And the next step will be a six month apprenticeship. And so, like, I think it's fair to say, assume that this functions exactly as we think it will, which is mm -hmm. recurring classes of 24 people. I think that is completely re reasonable. Um, they're not, like, they're scrutinizing it. Like, they're going to they're, they're gonna look at this and say, OK, is there evidence to, to support this claim that they can do cohorts of 24? And I think that when they look at the budget narrative, that's they're cross-referencing to say, like, okay, are they factoring in the exact costs as they would need to turn that into? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and and I haven't read this whole thing, but he needs to turn this into an answer. Mm -hmm. So that's question four. All right. Question six is Brian. This is a collaboration question. Um, yeah, the F E R C. We I haven't heard from Jesse. So are we ending up with the MCC thing there? Like we're we're pitching that as okay. That's down the six month road, the two year road. We include them right now. Yeah, I mean, I would absolutely mention them because they are a core part of our ability to offer the apprenticeship, the registered apprenticeship, and mm -hmm. you know we tasked Brian with getting in touch with them last meeting. So it's kind of it's on him at this yeah. point. We either, if we don't get the letter of support, that's not great, but I, you know, we should still submit. And you're still running outlaws, right? Or are you going to put that on hold? Or <clears throat> what's, what's your I mean, it's, Outlaws Inc. has become John Miller working with the Open Source Ecology and the ETS sponsorship program. So, like, I'm not doing any Outlaws Inc. specific work right now. Everything I'm doing is for you and for the veteran company. So, um, but what I can do is discuss 
I can describe that because it's mutually yeah. supporting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once so we get the job board up. Yeah, I mean, is that in the form of a letter of... Uh, LOA? What? What? LOS? I mean, I, I would be happy to write a letter of support, but my name's also going to be on this grant, so it would be redundant. It would be on the grant, but are you specifically identifying that you do add the task, the, the reporting like, part? Like, what, what reporting? Well, the reporting that's required from this grant. Like you, we're putting out some budget for admin, right? Four percent. I mean, would that still be you or no? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't count. I would write the grant as though I don't exist because you're going to need uh, have a software. Probably you have to pay a software to do it or hire somebody full time to do that. Um, full time is going to be full time. Maybe like what, what, as a part of the business, like like once you have business development going in, you have to factor in grant management as somebody's job. I mean, because you're gonna have to as a business, you'll have books, and you'll have an accountant, and part of their role ha should be managing the grant. Um, okay, but it's not gonna be a hundred percent of their time. It's gonna be. I don't think so. Yeah. 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 Okay, so I mean, if, it, yeah. if the message is that <clears throat> writing this grant is if you don't exist, then you should probably write a letter of support then. Because, and you have good, good verbiage on that, and you can just simply describe what we've done already. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, because we're kind of forgetting that. I mean, that's, from the outside, that looks, that, that's a major accomplishment there, and like a great, great, sto great weave into the whole story here. With right. Because right. they don't know who, who you are. What, That's fair. What do you do? Yeah. Um, All right. Letters of support. Yeah. yeah. So we've, I mean, we're, right now we're sitting with Jesse. We've got Clint's, um, mine. We're hopefully waiting on MCC. I don't know who else. Foundation for Regeneration, maybe. Mm -hmm. So that's five. Yeah. And regarding, uh, um, so regarding Steve's, contributions so the numbers there are uh, we can procure 200k as matching grants now how do we frame that now that was supposed to be a, a loan do we just call that okay here's 200k matching funds do we need documentation on that or some letter or what do we need on it but that's that's available so we have 200k and that's new that's not that's not from before this is new so we, I yeah, one second. Can, oh. So right now we got 250 plus 150 plus some of the land value. We didn't get an answer from Jesse regarding can we actually count the, the Free Enterprise Research Center facilities for VR, AR. Does that count as a monetary? Can we count that in within the monetary uh, matching, grant, matching funds? I, I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? Uh, for Jesse... Matching funds yeah. from the value generated by him, them providing the ARVR facilities. We should, that's a tangible thing. Can we convert that to a number for matching funds or no? I mean, yeah, you can if he gives you a letter saying that he's going to do it and you both agree on what the value of that is, I think. Yeah, can we, I, I tried to I get that answer from him. He hasn't responded. Can you, can okay. you follow up on him? Uh, yeah. Because I, I think that's very tangible. They're, they're open to it. They're, they're like, yes, you can use this center. Um, Missouri organizations are able to do that. Like, he already offered. I don't think it's a far cry to convert that to a number. Okay. Um, so for the first, the matching from Steve, um, I think that's this question. 200K. And that's all they are they going to ask you here's the documentation or they just say here it is um in-kind contributions and matching funds are noted attached documentation here okay is there okay. anything that that says we cannot uh, do that <clears throat> loan as matching funds well i think private dollars is can be the loan 
And then whether or not you count the private dollars as matching is... So, like, the, if I understand correctly, okay. you already have a loan that's private dollars going towards this project. If he's offering additional matching funds because you're applying for this grant, that would go in matching. That is reflected in the budget narrative. I can ask him if that's, that's how we can structure it. I, I'm not sure if... Uh... He's comfortable with that or not? Um, I can talk to him about I, that. I mean, is this is this it, it, is the two hundred k? Did he say it's contingent on you getting the ARPA grant? No, it's not contingent on it. Okay, well then you can just add it to the private. Yeah, I, I think probably that's what we might need to do. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we're we're actually pretty short on what we can apply for then then we kind of have to reduce the budget because we're not co coming up with those numbers. I mean, that's the, fine. Yeah. You know, it's still better than nothing. Yeah. And there will be other funding opportunities in the future. Um, so you have to turn this into an answer. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll talk to Steve what, <clears throat> what he suggests that should qualify as. And maybe he's got other insights, but yeah, I'll let you know Tuesday. Question 8, Section 5, this is you. Uh, Sorry, uh, re rewind a little bit. Question 8. Provide detail plus value. Sort of identified. Okay, I think so I still have to. I st I have to do some work on that, right? Right. Okay. So th this is all the same question. So num question number eight. Because that's also directly related to the budget. <clears throat> so I'll just try to uh, see. firm up my my narrative. And Steve was right. Um, he can help regarding all that. He with his media company but yeah I'll talk to him more about how we should word that because Havas Edge is a, is a company that pretty much their budgets are in the order of 5 million and stuff <clears throat> for projects so this would be a project that's on the side of that it's not like within the main <laughs> their main line of work but we're still getting assistance from them so uh -huh. um, I have to ask him how we present that like how we title that, like who are we working with? Is that Habas Edge or is it um, another company that he works with? Okay, um, you've answered these, it looks like. And I could, uh, yeah, I would have to clean that up, right? Or is, how's, how good is that? Well, right now I'm just looking for completion. So like there will be an editing period, mm -hmm. but the priority right now is just making sure every question has an answer. Yeah, so so for example, um, this this one. So question four. I can expand on section on that, six. Trying to make that coherent. Because um, there's two ways to look at it. So similar measurable outcomes, I mean, they're similar in the sense that we train loads of people to gain new skills. They're dissimilar in that right now we're talking specifically about jobs as opposed to skills that are not used for jobs. I mean, that's, that's the main difference. Um, so you can say in some way, yeah, we, we're training people but we're not getting to that, that jobs thing, which I, to me is I mean, it's a huge, huge difference. It's like literally entertainment versus work. I don't know. I mean, I think you can spin it, right? Because you got people together, they built a bunch of cool shit. Like, that's that's what you're doing. No, the only difference exactly. is that, so, so you I know, think, like... I think I, I can expand on that answer. Like, yeah, yeah, I think I think... But you did the hard part, which is getting people together and building cool shit. Now what you're doing is saying, okay, now we're going to sell the cool shit and yeah. use that to pay people for their labor. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. 
right, this is, I mean, this is the bear, right? Like the the budget narrative is okay. the thing. You have to take all this text basically and convert it to a table that looks something like this. Uh, right. With you, can, that... <clears throat> you can you can mess around with these. This is just the format that they gave us. Where's the where's the marketing stuff? The the reaching out outreach and stuff. Targeted marketing to impacted or disproportionately impacted individuals about training opportunities. Right here. Uh, what's the wor wording of disproportionately impacted individuals? What's that mean? It refers back to the beneficiary groups. So like unemployed due to COVID, certain uh, metropolitan statistical areas that have like low income and, you know, okay. or higher rates of poverty and stuff like that. Right. And for us, it was unemployed or underemployed. Right. But if we're producing media for that, is that video a different one than the aspirational video for marketing? No. But you, you've got a marketing campaign. Um, and like it's whatever flavor of marketing you do is what is your ability to target specific groups. But you're not like you're not only going to the unemployment office to show it to them. Like you're posting it online. Right. So the the tar the reason it's targeted is because it's going to describe an opportunity that only applies to a subset of the entire population. Right. And when we, when we, just for clarity on how we present this, if this is for unemployed or underemployed people, I mean, does underemployed mean everyone under the roof who wants career advancement opportunities? Yeah, I mean, technically, but, you know, this is, this is what a marketing a good marketing team would come up with, which is what message resonate. You figure out who you want, what what the characteristics of the people you want to walk in your door. You figure out what that archetype is, and then you tailor the message to them. Um, but here it sounds like so. So based on our discussion before, where where we have um, one is just the simple info for for the purposes of the grand versus the higher aspirational stuff. Yeah. How much of that higher aspirational stuff? Like the marketing to those, more the more the leadership and management and lifelong learning crowd, like the entrepreneurial yeah. branding. Because I mean, are we going to come to underemployed and unemployed people with an entrepreneurial branding? No, right? I mean, that's or well, or try to I mean, I, I I think I think absolutely you would. Um, and I, I don't know, man, like the work, the, the, the possibilities that this program, this project would create, I think at the core of it, you're talking about lifting people up and showing them something possible that they never considered before, right? Yeah. yeah. And so like, why not? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, they, they may not be the only people or the, or the most like, the best fit for a lifelong learning, uh, world-changing enterprise founder, but like that's that doesn't matter. You got to start someplace, and yeah. you can have a huge impact. You know, with the uh, the beneficiaries that we're targeting now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just about tailoring that message, um, and I think it include there's there's significant overlap, like the the aspirational audience versus the need to get paid audience kind of thing. We can mix that, I think, creatively. Well, part, you, you've already got, you know, recruitment portal for applicants budgeted in here. Mm -hmm. And developing that is going to involve a lot of really tough conversations about who, what type of person do we want participating in this? Yeah. And how do we yeah. select for those characteristics? But, okay, but check this one out then. What if we're saying to the to the government that we are going to be very selective are they are they particularly looking for this thing that's like no 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 you got to help that guy off the street 
Like you can be no, selective. It's your, no, it's your business, and you can, you can you can tell whatever story you want to the grant writers. Right. Like you can you can t- uh, two things can be true. You can be super selective, and you could be helping the guy on the street. Um, but yeah. that doesn't mean that you you are obligated to f- give charity to people or just give people jobs because they show up. Like you're not okay. sacrificing your ability to be discerning here. Okay. okay. Um, and in terms of like, because one of the questions that we talked about was, um, like how how will you reach and serve the identified eligible beneficiary groups? Like what eligible activities will be undertaken? And that's where you can talk about commu- like communicating the previous success of um, people you've collaborated with and the impact it's had on their lives. Or, I mean, like talk about the compressed earth brick machine that like you know built a village in El Salvador or whatever it was. I mean, there are, you have so many compelling stories. I mean, you yourself was a struggling farmer. Mm-hmm. Don't forget. Mm-hmm. Right. And like to simply telling that story is showing up with empathy to a group of people who are probably struggling and showing them what's possible. Yeah, so yeah. um I mean just don't 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 forget that at the core of what you're doing is lifting people up. Yeah. Yeah. But they have to they have to do they have to want to show up they and do it. Want to right? be lifted up high. Right. Is that um just just philosophically speaking like the people who really want to get lifted up high is that um that's still a very small fraction of the population or would you say do you have any numbers in mind like i think we're still catering to a very small segment um but so what i mean we can only help so many people right it's not like or we can also say it in another way. We can say, no, 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 we're actually trying to help everybody, but with these particular specifications. I, mean, I guess it's just how you, how you look at it. I, I think if yeah. I think if you're to you're you come up with the type of characteristics that you would envision make a successful open source world changing entrepreneur manufacturer graduate of this program, right? Mm-hmm. And you lay that on the population as is. You'd be like, yeah, it's a really small portion of the distribution. They're already employed in Silicon Valley and, you know, making lots of money doing stuff because they're super smart and motivated, right? Mm -hmm. But to me, that conduct that uh, there's an error in that method because you're you're not factoring in inspiration, and so like my foundational premise for the work that I do and the reason I'm so interested in working with you is because. Like you can you can inspire people to be more than and see more and open up their yeah. worldview and and like nobody's doing that right now and like not to go on a tangent but like my theory about the work that you're doing is that you're you can have an impact on total factor productivity for the macro economy if you can shift the population a little bit to the right the distribution to the right and, and the number of people and what they think they're capable of doing. Like if the average person yeah. like realize that they're capable of building their own house, like even conceptually, they thought that was a possibility. I think that that changes the way that they would approach everything else in the world. You nailed it. That, that's exactly right. That's, that's it. Uh, <clears throat> when I say what I, what I want to be, like my greatest aspiration is to inspire people. That's, that is, man, like, I got so inspired by doing this, like, there's no boundaries for me. I want to just share that with others, teach others to believe that, even, like, close, anywhere, <laughs> remotely close to what, what I think I can. Yeah. And, of course, for me, I always right. say, for me, what I think I can is only the beginning, too. So, like, that, again, I mean, you, you have a compelling story, you have... You've accomplished a tremendous amount. You've already proven so much is possible that you know nobody would have, Shit, yeah. you know, believed. Mm-hmm. And sh- like you're sharing the gift with other people. Now the the trick is to do it in a way that you know, and it, like there's going to be a, a long journey to get somebody from I'm just a a picker at Amazon to I could potentially build my own house and you know. Um, 
build 3D printers. Like there, there would be a long journey between those, those two points. And so we have to, you have to meet them where they are so that you give them a feasible journey, a path to get there, yeah. which involves pay, employment and education and a sense of community and all that other stuff. Do you think from that perspective, the performance coach makes a lot of sense in there? Because I think that that totally does. I think the performance yeah, coach makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think it makes sense for the people once you've already satisfied their basic needs, right? Like if if you can remove financial stress and put them in a good food environment and uh, give them the resources they need and the support that they need to feel safe, then a performance coach makes sense. <laughs> I think until you get to that point, everything is relegated to the back burner until you satisfy those like more primal needs. Which, I mean, the, the honest truth is like, if you're unemployed due to COVID and you still don't have a job now, especially in this labor market, you're probably like undergoing a lot of negative stress in your life. What's the that needs to be addressed first. What's the unemployed from COVID person? Is it more, more like in um, kind of like the meat packer and the, or is it like, a knowledge worker are knowledge workers in that too or not really i don't know man um i know there's a there's a uh economist i i heard recently who wrote um updated his book men without work and he's specifically concerned about prime age working males that are not in the labor force called nilfs n-i-l-f and um i don't know the number that's on my head but those are like the numbers are staggering. Like there's a tremendously, there's a very scary number of young men who are just not in the labor force. Um, and that is, actually it's right here, the link is right here. Um, and you're saying that, that that means people getting into trouble? Like people have nothing better to do and turn into Russians? <laughs> not turning into Russians, but like, I, I don't wanna, I don't wanna make the, the argument for him um, he's like a very accomplished statistician, and so everything he says has uh, statistics back behind it. I don't want to fuck that up, but um, the numbers are pretty scary, and I think it relates in some part to like what happened with COVID or the unemployment due to COVID. But I don't think that that COVID doesn't explain why they still don't have jobs. And I think like also went up, right? Yeah, consumption, that, that is another thing he points out is like consumption is higher or elevated than what you would expect given the per labor force participation rate. No, but I'm saying that it, people are more selective. Yeah, yeah, they're more selective. The resignation thing, right? Yeah, yeah, that's part no, of it. But, but now that you talk about that this way, I mean, that's, that's prime. I mean, that's a prime audience. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. But I, I, my my intuition here is that that's also a cultural. It's as much like a cultural thing as it is economic. Um. Anyways. Yeah. So that's a so so question one section five. That's something you got to do. Sorry. Go question one section five. Go back to it. What was the question? Oh wait, no, that's the one you told me to do. Never mind. <laughs> right. Okay. All right, so that's that's pretty much it. I mean, other than that, the big the big things you need to do that only you can do are this admin info section. And all the links are down here in section 8. Yep. Yep, yep. Um all right. So I've got a to-do list. I can email this out right after this meeting um we need at least two days to edit this back you know back and forth before we submit okay my main tasks are details of activities and budget and admin yeah so it's question eight section five question four se section six and then all of section seven and eight which is the budget and admin info Okay. 
now that we're, we've got all the permits you need for construction now, I can focus on this a little bit. Nice. Uh, a great way to, to get past work is to not do it. To find a way to not do it and still get the same results. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. What's that? Sorry about that one because it applied in this case too. Well, I missed it. Sorry, I was, I was ah. doing something else. Um, so, what are you working on now? I see your your overalls. Um, finished. Uh, I was just doing the water water and pressure test. Finished. Uh, basically, uh, siding and painting. And finish. Oh. Interior. Nice. Are you guys gonna move out? Move into the next one? Yep. Or Wait, really? I am. Well, yeah. someone's gotta test it. Yeah. Uh, Seriously, like a, the thermal, for example, the thermal performance there, because it's earth contact, you can know yeah. that it's warmer. And so, for example, last winter, never frozen there with a shallow insulated floor. It was not heated. Wow. Wow. It was amazing. What about, do you get any sun? I feel like it's it's surrounded by trees. Uh, morning sun. We might have to trim a little bit for the PV system. Yeah. 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 Okay. But yeah. Speaking of trees, are, are you, is your... Your forest still growing? A forest or which one? Which one? Didn't you start a tree farm? Didn't you yeah, plant a bunch of trees? A, yeah. Oh, I mean, there's there's tons of that. There's a forest. There's the whole plant out. We just discovered this amazing. I don't know if you saw one of my, um, you know, black walnut that comes out whole. Never seen anything like that in the world. This yeah. might be worth millions. This one tree here, actually. Uh, so really? we're saving it to propagate it. Yeah. That's awesome. You know, like how you know anything about black walnuts, but when you crack them, they're like tiny and they're impossible to get out. I didn't know that. I, all I know is that it's a very coveted woodworking material. Yeah, but for the edible side, we got one here that when you, when I cracked it, the whole half came out intact. I've never seen wow. that in my life. They typically come out in tiny pieces. Right, so right. Quite valuable. Very one, cool. One tree here, by the way. Yeah, so yeah, there's stuff growing here and there. Picked a bunch of apples, right. like this. <laughs> um, oh yeah, chestnuts. We got harvested some, some chestnuts. Oh man, they're good. How how are you uh, keeping them safe? Are they like genetically modified or something to prove, avoid blight or whatever that the, the chestnut? What about. Chestnut. Yeah. They're they're open pollinated, so they would pretty much come true from seed. I'm hoping that, I don't know about the black walnut, I'm assuming that it would come true from seed, but if it does come true from seed, then that means we can replicate that one quite a bit. It's, it's a question of the swarm breeding versus like very selected hybridized stuff. Yeah. Um, that's another story, but. Um, well, no, I just meant because the, the chestnut died off because of the disease, right? That's so another like, thing, that's the American chestnut. It's not the Chinese or, or other variations the the big native tree is it's having a hard time but there's other varieties that are resistant to all that cool yeah it's diversity man diversity yeah yeah okay all right well we should get to work yep. um i would hate to spend all this time and effort and then not not get any grant funding that would be a bummer yeah yeah Okay. All right, cool. Well, I will. I'll propose some meet, follow on meetups uh, in the email. Other than that, um, I'll get to work and see when we agree to meet next next week. Thank you. We shall all be greatly rewarded. Yeah, yeah. Also, uh, this. So, you want me to to postpone this meeting with Mary next week? Unless you think she's gonna be uh, able to do a letter of support or something like that, or that's too early. Yeah, I think it's too early for that. Maybe I think maybe you hold it off then. Okay, cool. I'll I'll send that email too. All right, man. Thanks a lot. Have man. a good one. You too. Bye. Take care.